Uh, welcome, uh, uh, Facebook. Facebook, welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. And you too. You too. Awesome. Have you been there yet? Numbers, chapter 20. we we'll start at verse 2. Okay, we're just going to read the like 10 verses and then we'll uh, there was no water for the congregation, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people chose with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we had died when our brother had died before the Lord? And why have you brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness, that we and our cattle should die there? And wherefore have you made us to come up out of Egypt to bring us into this evil place? It is no place of seed, or of figs, or of vines, or of pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they fell upon their faces in the glory of the Lord. Unto them. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water. And thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. So, sh so thou shalt give the congregation, and there be strength. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded them. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Hear now, you rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice, and the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. And the Lord spoke unto Moses and Aaron, Because you believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. This is the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel strove with the Lord, and he was sanctified in them. Great story, great story. Striking the rock, getting water out of the rock. You know, I uh, I uh, I brought a rock in with me. It's like visual. Yeah, catch. <laughs> <laughs> See the rock, right? I, I this is me a yacht. I'll return it. Uh, I said to somebody earlier this week. You know, you can't get water out of a rock, right? And it's a it's a saying that we all probably have used from time to time, right? Is there any way in your natural mind that you believe water can come out of this rock? Right? No. I mean, it's just no. <laughs> what? Not unless it's coconut. But coconut's not a rock. <laughs> coconut's a coconut. <laughs> so you can tell he just came back from Jamaica. <laughs> but no, a, a rock is a rock. You look at it, you say, how can water come from a rock? But yet here in this portion, it did. Uh, but the method of how it came out, uh, God gave Moses instructions. First of all, the children of Israel uh, delivered from bondage for 400 years, uh, come out. Would you be happy if you were a slave for 400 years and your people were, and every year you had to make brick and you had to do this and you had to do it for somebody else and you were oppressed all the time and abused? And then a deliverer comes along and he delivers you through the, the seven plagues, nine plagues, I don't know, I don't know, I have a conversation about the nine plagues, and uh, delivers them, they're set free, they're wandering in the wilderness. Um, they had a chance to go in the promised land, but they, they got too afraid, and so they're wandering in the wilderness. Now they're into the wilderness of sin. And uh, manna's coming down every day, manna, from heaven, for them to eat. But they're in a place where there's no water, and they have cattle, and there's like 600,000 people. 
and there's no water. So they, you know, the first thing they do is start complaining, murmuring. Uh, is this why you brought us here, Moses? So that we could die here? There's no water here. There's no pomegranates here. There's no coconuts here. There's no, there's no figs. There's nothing. This is why you brought us from Egypt? So that we could die here? I mean, now they're already getting the bread from heaven every day. They, they should have saw the power and glory of God. But uh, Moses and Aaron did the right thing. They left her, They left them there. They said, oh, we can't listen to this. You know, it's a good point for us tonight. When you are surrounded by negativity, walk away. You know, like if people are just complaining all the time about this and about that, it's okay to walk away. Moses and Aaron walked away and where did they go? They went to the, the presence of God and they fell on their faces. And then the, the glory of the Lord filled the place. Notice the, the, the order. They fell on their faces in prayer and then the glory of the Lord appeared. So not, not that the glory of the Lord appeared and they fell on their faces. They fell on their faces first, which means prayer ushers in the presence of God into our lives. When we go before God and we fall on our faces, so to say, or get on our knees, is what we do, or, or just in a, a place where we get quiet and start praying, uh, the presence of God comes in to that situation. And then it spoke to Moses and said, go back to the people and take the rod. Why the rod? The rod signified the power of God. The rod was what uh, got changed into a snake. The rod is what budded. The rod was in in the, uh, the tabernacle. It was preserved. It represented the power of God. Take the rod, my authority that I've given to you. Go back to the people and tell them and, and, and stand before them and speak to the rock. Like, go back to this rock here. Speak to this rock and water will come out you speak to the rock. Um, and Moses didn't argue with God and say, well, how can water come out of a rock or anything like that? How's this going to happen? Moses knew already God can do anything. Speak to the, So he goes back, he stands before the children of Israel, and uh, it, Moses seems to think that he needs to add a little bit of drama to the, to the situation. Like, uh, I'm going to raise my voice. I'm going to say, oh, you rebels complaining about no water. We have to bring water from a rock for you here. Boom, boom, and he strikes the rock. Uh, and water comes out, which is an amazing thing. But God didn't tell him to do that. God told him to speak to the rock, not hit the rock, not talk to the people in a rude way. Uh, God's intention was to provide water for the people. God was not upset that the people were thirsty. They were in 600,000 people plus animals and they were in a wilderness where there was no rock. What God wanted to show them was that he was Jehovah Jireh and the Lord will provide. I will provide water for you where there is no water. I will provide water for you where there is no water. I will have it come out of the rock where you can't even believe that water can come out of the rock. But I'm going to have it come out. And I'm going to have enough water come out of the rock that you're all going to be, uh, have your thirst quenched, including your animals. That much water. But to, um, and, and Moses was told to just speak to the rock and the water would come up. But Moses, uh, by hitting the rock and raising his voice and chiding the people, was trying to. Um, uh, interfere with the plan of God or add to the plan of God. And I, I, I'm, think, I'm thinking about this tonight in this way, that like, first of all, uh, many, um, many ministers or pastors who stand behind pulpits, God tells them to speak a message and for some reason they think they have to add to what God is saying. And they they have to have all this demonstration and all this uh, fanfare and pounding of the pulpit and screaming and all this stuff. And God simply says, just open your mouth and speak my words. The power is not from you, it's from me. Moses was, by hitting the rock and raising his voice, was trying to say, well, maybe the power is through me. 
Maybe it's through my hitting of the rock is going to, to add to this. And God's saying, no, I don't want any part of you in this. I don't want any part of humanism in this. It's not a natural thing that's going to happen. It's a supernatural thing. And you don't have to raise your voice, and you don't have to hit the rock, and you don't have to do anything. When God is going to ordain something to happen, you just have to speak, and it's going to happen. Have you ever seen the old Jesus movies, like Jesus of Nazareth is one, uh, other movies about Jesus? And yeah, I love those movies, except I don't like when they show the miracles, because when they, sh they show the miracles, they always show Jesus like really straining to do a miracle, you know, like he's about to cast out a demon and, and he like raises his voice like, Satan, leave him, and he's shaking and everything, and then the demon comes out, right? Okay, but God doesn't have to do that, right? God has all authority and power. You just have to say, Satan, be gone. No raising of the voice, no shaking. Because he's God, he has all authority and power. He doesn't need help from anybody, and Jesus certainly didn't need to do any of that. That was Hollywood. Think this will be great. We'll do this in the movie. Everybody, go, whoa! Did you see that? It would be instead of Jesus just sitting there calmly going, "Satan, leave him," and he had, and Satan would have to do it because of the authority of Jesus Christ. You see, that's the like God wanted Moses just to speak to the rock, just say rock, uh, have water come out, and it would have came out. And to me, isn't that more amazing to just simply have a calm statement that says, uh, come out, and water comes out, than to have all this fanfare striking the rock twice and doing this. This was Moses' idea, not God's. And because it, what it was, was it was also, if you read how it, what it's saying, that God said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe me, that I could make water come out of a rock. You thought you had to hit the rock to make it happen, but I can make water come out of a rock. And you didn't believe that I could do that, so you added to what I was saying, you're not going in the promised land. And said, so that's pretty severe. It's pretty severe not to believe God, or do what God tells you to do when you are his spokesperson for an entire nation. So anyways, uh, the water still came out. That's the other point. The water still came out. Even though there was an act of disobedience in the method that God told them how to do it, the God so faithful to his people that, it, uh, that the water still came out and supplied all the people. It, what we see that from that is a gracious God who is very faithful to his people. And he already knew that they had a need. He already knew that they had a need. Like it says in Matthew 6, uh, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall put on, what you shall wear. And your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. Imagine that. Like God is saying to us, you don't have to worry all the time about how you're going to provide for your family, how you're going to do that. Follow me. Put, put the kingdom of God first. I know what you have need of. Like, everybody in this room has, like, needs in your soul, and God knows what they are. You know, you don't, might not have told anybody, but God knows what your need is. And He knows how to meet that need. And you are, we all might sit here and say, well, I think we all need a million dollars, and I think that will solve everything. And no, that's not my greatest need. It's not even a need. I don't need a million dollars. I want a million dollars. That's the difference. I don't need it. Uh, but God knows what we do need. What do I need tonight more than anything? I need to know that I'm accepted by God. And I am. Ephesians 1, 6, 1, 7. I am accepted in the blood. I need to know that I'm forgiven. And I am. God forgave my sins because the blood of Christ paid for them on the cross and I received Christ. I need to know that I'm loved. God is love. 1 John 4.18 uh, He loves, we love Him because He first loved us. God is love. Greater love has no man than this than a man lay down his life for his friends. These are my needs tonight. My soul has a need to be loved, accepted, and forgiven. Those three things my soul has a need of. And there's something else. Uh, there's other things our soul has need of tonight. One of them we're doing right now. 
We, our soul, when it, a soul that is redeemed by the power of the blood of God, create has a need uh, for the Word of God. Like I need to hear the Word of God. I need to read the Word of God. My soul thrives on it. It's like our physical bodies need to eat. We all agree with that, right? Uh, what we eat is a whole other story, but we need to, we need to eat. Uh, and we eat every day, and we do a pretty good job at it, you know, three meals a day, plus more, whatever. Uh, but we make sure we eat. We make provisions to eat. Our soul, it needs to eat. It needs to feed on the Word of God. It's, it's what nourishes my soul. And we always ask this question, are you feeding your soul the way you're feeding your body? Most of us do not. Most of us do not. If we're honest with ourselves, we eat for the physical body way more than we do for the spiritual. And you say, well, that's that seems like the, the natural thing. We, our bodies get hungry. Your soul gets hungry. My soul gets hungry. A soul that receives Christ and then goes its merry way and never bothers with God is a, uh, um, what's the word? Like an anorexic soul. It's like starving itself. Uh, because it, it needs the Word of God to grow and to build itself up on and you hear it in church and that's why we encourage people to, go to come to church to hear the Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Okay, And so as I hear the Word of God, faith uh, is built up like a muscle in my heart and I, as my soul, I start using it, my soul be becomes healthy it's not sick anymore, it becomes healthy. The Word of God is permeating my soul. I'm taking in that nourishment uh, of the Word. Uh, in Psalm 23, uh, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. But God has a meal for us when our enemies are attacking us. What does that mean? I get attacked by the people in the world uh, that are uh, my three enemies as a Christian in the world, my old sin nature, and the devil. I get attacked by them, and God has prepared a meal for me to eat before them that will nourish me, uh, saying that yeah, they have no effect on you. Eat, eat the meal that I have for you. Uh, we don't need to strike the rock twice to get water out of it. We don't need to shout. We don't need to to say all these things to get the water to come out of it. God has water come out of us. Speak and the water will come out. Imagine uh, how we could be like the children of Israel. Things aren't going right in our lives and we get all upset at God. Why? I don't, ever since I became a Christian, everything's going wrong. I've heard that a million times. I've probably said it a few times. Everything's going wrong. If I was, the world was never like this when I was back in the world. No, because you didn't have those enemies that were bothering you all the time. Why does everything have to go wrong? But we forget that God has a provision for me in the presence of all those things that are going wrong. God has a peace for me. He has a calm for me. He has a mind for me. He has a solution for me. He has a provision for me in my life for all these things that are going wrong. God does. And it's a question of just speaking. Like, imagine if Moses obeyed God. Imagine if the children of Israel just calmly, because they were receiving manna every day, imagine if they just realized, hey, there's no water here. Maybe we should ask God for some water. You know, like, hey God, there's no water here. Could you provide water like you do the man? Sure. Hey, yeah, go to the rock, there's water for everybody. But no, they didn't have to uh, chide with Moses and Aaron. They didn't have to complain, but they chose to. We don't have to do that either. When something need, is needful in our life, we don't have to do all of that and, and stomp our feet and do all of that. And we don't have to be like Moses and say, well, I'm going to help God get this done and I'm going to strike the rock twice and I'm going to do all these things and I'm going to stir up the body to believe God more and all this... No, you can just speak the word. Speak it, and the water will come forth. Remember the story in uh, Luke of the centurion? Uh, Jesus, uh, he comes to Jesus and he says, My servant is, is dying. And Jesus, Jesus before he says, so, so I will come and heal him. And the centurion, No, oh, no, no, you don't have to come. I'm not worthy for you to come to my house. I'm a centurion, I'm a Roman. 
if you recognize who Christ was, he goes, you don't have to come, just speak the word, and my servant will be healed. I understand authority. And, all, and Jesus marveled at his belief because he, he had this belief in his heart that the only thing God needed to do was speak the word. He didn't need fanfare. He didn't have to even come to his house. None of that. He just had to speak the word. And this is, this is a great attitude for you and I to have in our hearts and to realize that, that God can bring water from a rock. We don't believe we, we can do it. We could probably all say, what can we do to get water to come out of that rock tonight and go around the road? And you would say, Pastor, there's nothing you can do. You can't get water. Just like I said to the person this earlier, but you can't get water from a rock. We use it to, and more in the sense of like, somebody doesn't have any money and, and they owe money. You say, well, they can't get water out of a rock. So, because in our mind, it's impossible, right? And this is the, the other point we want to see here is that this is exactly what God wanted them to see. That I am the God of the impossible. I can do anything. I can make all things possible. Uh, when Jesus said it to the man who had the lunatic son, he said, do you believe? And he said, I do, Lord. Uh, if you can believe, all things are possible if you can believe. And the man said, I do believe, but I have unbelief to help me with that. Uh, Nothing's impossible with God. You and I would say it's impossible for water to come out of that rock. You know, if I was a, 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 a misled pastor or something, I might say, we're going to believe God. We're not leaving here tonight until God brings water from this rock. So settle in. And you know what you would do? You would get your water bottle and pour it over the rock. So I got to know. <laughs> How's that? Close enough. No, what Jesus said, if you had faith as a mustard seed, you could say to a mountain, you'd be allowed to be moved to the sea. So why can't I say, I want to see water come out of this rock? Because we just have this incredible unbelief that is built into us. Because uh, through tradition, through um, natural forces, we've, nobody's ever seen water come out of a rock. But that's not true. Moses saw it. Aaron saw it, 600,000 people saw it, it happened, God ordained it. Well, that was a special time. Yes, it was. And maybe God has never done it again, but it's not impossible. If God wanted water to come out of this rock, it would come out. Believest thou this? It's a challenge for all our hearts tonight. But God, God's not really interested in making water come out of this rock. Because we can just go to the refrigerator and get a bottle of water. It's nice and cold over there. We don't need water to come out of this rock. But we do have some needs in our heart and in our souls that maybe we've convinced ourselves that it's impossible. It's not possible for this to happen. And maybe because you convinced yourself that something is not possible, that's never going to happen, then you stop asking God for it. You stop praying for it, and maybe you stop complaining about it instead. Maybe this is what happens with us, just like it happened here in the story. And maybe God is gonna show you uh, that he is the God of the impossible. He loves to make things happen when we say it can't. And I don't see it. But if we go to him in prayer, and simply have that choice to say, I can complain, or I can ask God. I can, get, I can just keep getting negative or I can ask God. I can just do what Moses and Aaron did and say, I'm going to leave the negativity and I'm going to go before God and get on my knees in the presence of God, uh, fill the, it, the, spoke, the place they were in, and he spoke to them. And, and I know there's people in this room who have done that with situations in their life, and they have heard the still small voice uh, or they have sensed the calming presence come into their soul because they've gone to God with something that was impossible for them to do. And this is, this is what Christianity is all about. Uh, believe in God to do things where it, it seems impossible for men to do. It seems like a situation that's never going to change. And uh, maybe people are involved, maybe... Uh, um, you know, situations are involved, the doors seem permanently closed, but it's not for God. Nothing is too high.
hard for him to do. If he can provide manna every day for 40 years and provide water when they need it to even come out of a rock, he can do anything in our lives, in our situations. Uh, we have to trust him for that and go to him and, and simply ask him, like, uh, Lord, would you help me with this? I'm not going to complain, I'm not going to get negative, but I'm looking for water to come out of the rock here. Everybody's telling me not to even bother praying. Have I, have I, anyone ever had people tell you that? What do you pray for? God's not going to do anything. The devil loves for you to, get, to whisper that in your ear to other people, or maybe to your own thoughts. What do you bother praying for? God's not going to do that. Why would he do that? Why would God do that? You know, my, my wife and I thought, we always talk, talk about and laugh about the story of <clears throat> um, uh, my wife was somebody at Merry Christmas once, or said something. She would pray for somebody, and the person said, Don't, you can't, God's not going to answer prayers. Now it's Christmas time. He's busy. <laughs> so, uh, that this, the people's concepts of God, and they've been convinced from different things. Some people have a concept that they're not worthy to go to God with their impossible situation. That they've been too bad, or they've sinned too much, or God doesn't want to hear from them, or He's upset with them. This is not true. This is not true. It's like Moses did what he did because he thought he could help God, he thought he would embellish the situation. He disobeyed God, yet God still had the water come out. It doesn't matter of the weakness and the frailty that we have, God is still going to do what God is going to do. And you have every right as a child of God to go to Him and ask Him to make water come out of the rock for a situation in your life. And believe that He is able to do it. Because He is. Uh, doing the impossible uh, where we... Doing the possible where we think it's impossible. This is what God is about and wants to do in our lives. Amen? Amen. 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 Okay, let's pray. Uh, if you're watching tonight or if you're here listening, that, um, I know one thing that, that some people say is impossible. Um, I, I had a belief one time in my life that it was impossible for me to go to heaven because I was that if you did such and such, you were going to go to hell, and that was it. You know, there was no hope for you, uh, and, and and so I was convinced I'm, I can't go to heaven. And then one day, somebody told me about uh, the love of God and about uh, Jesus Christ dying for my sins, and that God loved me, and I just needed to receive Him, and I could go to heaven. And boy, I, I wanted that so much because I was so convinced that I could not go, but I wanted to go. Uh, and I wanted to know that I could go. And I, I was even more surprised when I, I learned that I, if I said the prayer and believed on Jesus, I was going. That was the end of the story. I didn't have to do anything to earn it. I was going. It was a free gift. And that that's, that's the plan of salvation. That's the gospel. And that's what's offered to each and every individual. In the world uh, eternal life God Jesus Christ came and died for our sins so that we could have eternal life the wages of my sin was death yes Christ died and took upon him my sins uh, and all the sins of the world upon him and satisfied the justice and judgment of God so that we could have peace with him and all we have to do is believe it and receive it and if you've never done that in your life, and you're watching, or, and you'd like to say this prayer, Dear Lord Jesus, I receive you into my heart. I want to go to heaven. I want to know you. I want to have a relationship with you. It's that simple. A simple little prayer, but a sincere heart that means it. And Christ comes in, and you are saved, and you're going to heaven. And Father, we pray that if there's uh, anyone that said that prayer tonight watching, uh, that they would have a... a confirmation in their heart right now that they that they have just uh, uh, became children of God or your son, your son and your daughter and Father we pray that uh, first of all we thank you that you can make water come out of a rock 
it, it speaks to us that you can make anything happen in any situation. And we need to believe that tonight, that water can come out of the rock. If that is what you want to happen, then it can happen. Lord, the things that are in our lives that we deem impossible will help us to see that they are, they are not impossible. Nothing is too hard for you. Nothing is too difficult for you, Lord. Help us to trust you more and more in those areas of our lives, Lord. Amen. We love you and praise you tonight. In Christ's name, amen. 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 amen.